the current state of work is actually very different to how a lot of economists predicted. They talked about how in the 21st century, we're only going to have 15 hour work weeks, whereas now I feel like there's people having 15 hour <laughs> work days. Yeah. Many of us are building our entire identity around work. To me, that became more and more clear as I stepped into the American work market as well. You're listening to Someday List, a podcast by To Do. Every month, we're sitting down with some of our favorite creatives, founders, and entrepreneurs to talk about what they're doing, how they got there, and what they want to tackle next. I'm your host, Evan Lian, and today I'm sitting down with Alice Catter, the creator of Out of Office Network, a community-centered research and design lab focused on the interplay between work and life. Alice has led efforts at companies like Dropbox and Working Not Working to build community and connection, particularly in the face of remote work. She writes about fostering creativity and, as she calls it, life-work balance. And today we're talking about how to make work more sustainable in our own lives. Before we get started, if you're looking for an easy way to get organized, look no further. To Do is a thoughtfully constrained, minimalist to-do list app that is as simple as paper. Because we believe that simple stays organized. To Do helps you focus on the things you need to get done so you have more time for the things that matter. Start your 30-day free trial at todo.com or download the free mobile app. On to the interview. Welcome back to Someday List. I am your host, Evan Lean, and today I'm sitting down with Alice Catter, a culture and community strategist, the creator of the Out of Office Network, a community-centered research and design lab focused on the interplay between work and life. We're going to dig into exactly what that means. But first, welcome, Alice. Thank you so much for your time today. Uh, how are you doing? Thank you so much for having me. I'm doing pretty well. Thank you. We spoke a couple of years back towards the beginning of quarantine, and you're actually interviewing me about my creative process. So it's nice to turn the tables and get to interview you. Can you tell me a little bit about Out of Office and the work that you do? Out of Office is a life-centered research and design lab. And that's actually a new sort of focus that we're now taking on since the start of the year. That's been a lot of shifts over the last couple of years. My focus is now really on exploring what the interplay between how we work and how we live is. So I think there is a really big power in seeing the two things as living in harmony or living in balance when we look at well-being and when we look at the different pillars of our lives. I think it's always important to see them as being in balance with each other. So if we're over-investing into one area of life, then it's very likely that we're getting burned out in that area. So I think my approach is really looking at what these different pillars do, how they intersect and how we can actually bring a spirit of playfulness into our work and then also take this approach to living more creatively in general. I believe that if we live a more creative life, that will feel more regenerative and feel more sustainable in the long run. And so that's what I'm researching with out of office, but then also bring into my client work where mm -hmm. I do look more specifically at how we can build a culture of well-being and a culture that fosters belonging, creativity, and joy in workplaces. We're going to dig some more into that, but I always like to hit the rewind button a little bit. Uh, you have a background in psychology, and that is pretty evident in your current work. But previously, you've done a lot of work in social, brand, and community strategy where that connection is maybe not as prominent or direct. Was there a point in your early career that sort of motivated you to start down this path? Yeah, I think one way where I actually realized there's another world to the traditional sort of psychology work, which in my studies was actually very much focused on clinical psychology initially. I started studying in Austria where yeah, it has this very clinical like research and statistics heavy focus. So I did an Erasmus in Barcelona and Erasmus is like a, a European student exchange program. You usually spend six months to like a year in a different country at a partner university studying. And when I did my Erasmus in Barcelona, there was actually the opportunity to explore different courses. And so what I was really interested in is this consumer and marketing related psychology as well. So that's, I think, where I started seeing a bit more of the interplay between psychology can also be applied more to the business side of things. And then really, I got more into the topic of new ways of working and just thinking about sort of alternative ways of working as well by working in the agency industry and then transitioning into freelance and being independent. And I think that to me showed that there's actually a very different way of working. And I managed to 
travel a lot while working for different clients and bopping around Europe at that time, just as like visit friends and crush people's couches and just go into different places, work from cafes and just work with a lot of different people and get diverse perspectives around that. So I think that's where the interest started to really peak. In a, another interview you had done, you mentioned this instance of encountering the American perspective on workism for the first time. How mm-hmm. would you describe that? And how did it contrast from maybe some of these other environments that you were experiencing at the time? I think it was actually in an article in The Atlantic where I read the term for the first time. And mm-hmm. the article spoke about how workism or work became this religion for Americans and that the current state of work is actually very different to how a lot of economists predicted. In that interview, they talked about how in the 21st century, we're only going to have 15 hour work weeks, whereas Now I feel like there's people having 15 hour work days. (laughs) And so it's just like obviously something that didn't really happen. And at that time, people were also seeing the focus of our lives will be around really the leisure time. And our challenge will be how can we figure out how we spend our leisure time because we will have so much because everything will be automated. But yeah, (laughs) things are still being automated and actually even more with AI really taking a driver's seat right now. Mm -hmm. But obviously, yeah, it's a very different culture of work. So for me, I think... um, The sort of idea of workism is related to our business as usual way of working and culture of work, where many of us, I think, are building our entire identity around work. They're really missing the beauty of everyday life and the beauty of play and exploration and mystery and wonder and surprise that we can actually see in our lives when we live a different way of living that is not so much focused on just work. And to me, that became more and more clear as I sort of stepped into the American work market as well. There were certain moments where I also encountered, for instance, terms like unplug PTO, someone mentioning that they would go and unplug PTO. And I would be like, okay, is there a plugged and an unplugged PTO? (laughs) Is that something we need to point out because it's not Uh normal that we're unplugged on our PTO? So there were different moments where I was like, okay, this is interesting. Uh And I think in other countries that I've worked in before, like I'm from Austria and I've also lived in London and have worked in different agencies there. And I've just seen that to be a really different approach. I feel like in Europe, work didn't take over our entire lives. Like it was Mm. one component and it was one part of our lives, but definitely not the biggest one. And I, for instance, also had like bosses, one boss in specific who told me and my team where we were uninspired or when we felt like we were not really having too much on our plates. They were like, oh yeah, just go to a museum and check out a new exhibition to make you feel more inspired. And as go out and do things or in Barcelona where I spent a month last summer, actually, I noticed that a lot of restaurants would offer a full lunch menu with a starter and like a main and then also like a beverage and a dessert. And people would actually go for lunch with their colleagues for like a good hour and just spend some time outside and have a nice conversation. And I feel like that is just very different from the culture of work that I experienced in the U.S. And that became more and more clear to me what different approaches to work there really are. Can you think of any specific examples of things that you have tried to fold into your everyday work life to protect yourself from burning out? I think one thing that I found for myself is just I really enjoy getting out of my sort of everyday rigid way of working. I really like to have non-linear work days and just break up my day in different ways. So I'm actually not really into working from home, for instance. I actually love working from cafes and different co-working spaces where I'm Mm -hmm. surrounded by people or meet a friend and work from someone's place, but not necessarily just sitting at my desk at home alone all day. (laughs) And for me, that's really like a way to actually break it up with that. I feel much more inspired and you get so many different inputs and you just see or even hear things that people talk about, which might really change our perspective. What I love about also being independent is actually having the opportunity to work on a lot of different things and having a lot of different conversations with different people as well. So really trying to diversify my inputs that can be through conversations or working from a different place, or it can also be travel. It's just bringing in different tools to create more human ways of working. I think one way of not burning out is actually having fun at work and making Mm -hmm. work feel more like play different rituals that bring the team together in more meaningful ways. Like I designed a 
corporate tarot card with Dropbox, which is all about bringing a sense of joy and magic into our work days and opening up different conversations that you might not have by jumping onto a Zoom call. And with that, decreasing the risk of burning out because actually it's fun doing things together and it's fun to explore and go down different rabbit holes. You mentioned that you have worked in the agency setting and now you do consulting work. When it came to the moment that you decided you wanted to go independent, was that idea daunting to you? Changing into an independent setup was definitely a change to how I used to work in like an agency setting. For me, it really opened up the opportunity to really be flexible and having this freedom and flexibility and autonomy as well to like work in a more creative way. And that meant on one hand, really designing my day more creatively. So being able to work from different places, but also sometimes switching up my schedules completely. Like now I split my time between the US and Europe. Over the last two months, I was in South Africa and just spent the winter, the European winter there. And I think for me, it allowed me to really yeah, break up my routine and also break up my day. And sometimes I would go for a hike in the morning. If I work in EST, for instance, I would just have the morning mm -hmm. for myself and do different things. And then sometimes I would work later at night. But I think it is sometimes really challenging and scary to be independent. And there are no given paths. Um, mm -hmm. There's actually a book that I just started reading from Paul Miller. It's called The Pathless Path. And it's very much about when you're independent, there is no path. So sometimes that's very scary. And so it's like trying to embrace that. You're someone who has, or it appears to have a very healthy grasp and perspective of work and balance in your life. Has it ever gotten to a point where work was draining for you? Yeah, I mean, there were definitely times or there are again and again times where work feels very draining. Sometimes it's just me personally being too obsessed with certain things and I'm losing the lightness around my work. And I had that just recently, a couple of months ago, I felt like so stuck and I felt, oh my God, I can't really figure out what my next steps should be. And I really wanted to like crack this nut and I just couldn't really crack it. And what sort of then actually reminded me about, or it pulled me out of that, it was actually a, a little yoga session that I did. And the yoga session was about playfulness and taking things easier. And I just had this moment where I was like, why am I overthinking this so much? It's <laughs> actually not that difficult or that important to think about it so much. Just take it a little easier and just don't overthink things. So I think now mm -hmm. what I'm really trying is, thinking about things more long-term and really also when I'm working on new projects, really trying to find more longer-term approaches to that and be more aware of my rhythms and circularity because I am very convinced that we cannot just keep pushing and always have like a go, go, go mindset. Lately, I'm actually very inspired by nature. I was at a course, which is all about regenerative business as a force for good, which was very much like looking at nature as well and what we can learn from nature. And one of the things that I took really with me is that nature has these circles, right? And there's different periods where animals are sleeping or nature getting burned and it's starting from scratch. And those things, I think we also have them as humans and they're just not really built into how we work right now. So I'm also now thinking a lot about what can different rhythms of work look like and how can we build and adjust to that. Yeah. And I think like another thing that is actually quite, for me, often exhausting when it comes to work is being self-employed. As I mentioned before, like I'm reading this book about the pathless path and what's sometimes really hard is that there just is no path. Like when you're working in a corporate, you're having like your learning and development plan and your career steps and this ladder that you can climb up. And that might, of course, also be exhausting because it's a lot of pressure and a certain direction. But it is at the same time, I feel also very often exhausting to not have any of that and just having to figure it out yourself, right? There's mm -hmm. a million directions you could take that's on one hand really great, but also sometimes feels very overwhelming. And sometimes I do just think, and my husband and friends can probably confirm that, that I'm sometimes like, can someone just give me a job and tell me what to do? Because <laughs> I just don't know. And it's so hard to figure it out. So yeah, I think that's probably a couple of the things that do often feel overwhelming. I'd love to hear more about this course that you had just mentioned, the regenerative business as a force for good. On the one hand, it's encouraging that there is this program for us to think about how business should be a force for good. On the other hand, it feels a little discouraging, right? That we have to say that 
Can you tell me a little bit more about the program and what you learned there? Yeah, it was actually, I mean, it's a program that's at Schumacher College, which is really a lot about defining a new economy. Or if you're familiar with the book from Schumacher, Small is Beautiful. So it's very much about running businesses with the intention that people matter, that the planet matters. So this course was very much about taking different examples of nature and looking at how we can actually build systems, cultures of work that are more regenerative. And so for me, that means how can we build and design cultures of work that feel nourishing and that feel playful and that feel like we actually don't burn ourselves out by working. And now I'm really deep in exploring like what different models of work exist in the world, Mm -hmm. how we can redefine our metrics of success to actually shift our perspectives around work. I think we need to start imagining different ways of working in order to also start living them, right? A big part of the work that I will be doing over the next month is really thinking about dreaming big and imagining like what a different way of working could look like and inviting different perspectives around that. Are there common issues that you see, and maybe I'll limit this to American companies, that you see them struggling with, especially around remote work now that we have lived in this reality for a couple of years now? Yeah, I think there's definitely a couple of sort of similarities or patterns that are emerging or that have been emerging. And I write about this a lot as well on Out of Office. I think a lot of people feel depleted. Their creative energy feels depleted. They don't really feel motivated. There's also the movement that's related to it, like quiet quitting, great resignation, right? Like a lot of people Mm -hmm. just don't really feel engaged with their work anymore because they're just feeling like a small number somewhere in the organization that's not really taken care of or there's just too much on their plates especially now I guess with the tech industry really suffering another big challenge with that because obviously the work won't really get less Mm -hmm. so in terms of resources it's really hard to make sure people don't have too much on their plates if less people are part of an organization. On the other hand, I think one challenge that I was also seeing a lot over the last years is definitely working in silos. And with remote work, it takes more intention to actually have people talk to each other more. In a lot of companies, I've heard that people often feel just like, you have a Slack icon. I think it's really important to make sure that we're not just feeling like this little Slack icon in our digital worlds, but are actually able to show our holistic and more creative person that we all have inside of us more. And I think that's a challenge that I'm seeing, like people working in silos, but then also people not really being able to bring their whole selves or different parts of themselves to work as well. And feeling, yeah, feeling disconnected, not really feeling a sense of belonging. And then the other thing also, I think like it's just people try to figure out how work in general can be more sustainable and then also how work can actually feel more joyful and how work can actually feel more more playful especially recently with even more challenges coming up it just feels often very heavy and very serious and I feel like there's a certain lightness and joyfulness and creative approach to work missing quite often this interview is brought to you by to do you're juggling a lot and you don't know where to start we've all been there And that's why we made To Do with the core belief that less is more. To Do is the minimalist to-do list app to ease your cognitive burdens. We are the most refreshing task manager in a sea of monster energy drinks. No pings, no feeds, no comments, just you and the things you need to get done in a simple, intuitive interface. Use code SOMEDAYLIST for 20% off when you subscribe at T-E-U-X-D-E-U-X dot com. Back to the interview. So when you are engaging with a new organization, how do you find the right balance between being somewhat of an objective outside observer, but also really getting familiar and understanding the culture well enough to help them develop tools and resources around this? So usually I start with a lot of listening and just being a part of a lot of conversations and really immerse myself into the organizations that I work with. I am a people person, so I don't really struggle talking to people and I love talking to people. So I just talk to a lot of people and really try to understand the current culture and then also do more qualitative and quantitative research, having different interviews or doing surveys or just getting a better insight for what people are really feeling within their organization. So part of that is really immersing myself into it and then pulling together and co-creating strategies and principles and programs for how the issues that are present within 
the company, what people feel they're missing and what they would like to have more of, basically creating strategies and programs and rituals for people to implement into their day to day and giving people opportunities to, for instance, connect more with each other or learn more from each other. And often that's related to creating more opportunities for creative inspiration and actually sparking creative energy. And sometimes it's rituals to foster a better sense of belonging and enable different types of connections within either teams or across the different departments or across different orgs. And then sometimes it's also really coming up with creative production ideas or creative practitioner toolkits or specific communities around a certain topic of interest where it's about building a community of practice within a company. If people have a certain topic that they all want to explore further and have in common and then setting up the structure and the ecosystems for people to get into that and explore that together and making it all a collaborative process. This is perhaps a little bit of a chicken and egg question, but as you're doing this sort of client work, developing tools and resources around work-life balance, did that proceed out of office or did out of office come first in your mind? Are they separate entities or are they coexist? And this is where you collect your thoughts and write about it and process it. I would just love to hear more about where the idea for out of office came about. I would say they both are living in harmony with each other. The idea actually came to me in Cape Town where I was on a hike and I was just like, okay, I want to create more awareness for a different way of working and living that I had experienced at that time. So it started as just like, oh, I could create different guides for work and play in different cities. And then moving to the US, it actually turned into more of a thought platform and education around different ways of living and working because I saw that American work culture is just like a whole different story. And I wanted to give a different perspective, a perspective that I personally observed. And so I wanted to share that and wanted to bring in different ways of people to actually integrate that into their lives as well. So that's where it also then came about to create more worksheets and these like creative life design retreats that I'm also hosting right now. But I would say with my work and out of office, it then actually became more of an interplay because I was really diving into a lot of rabbit holes with out of office. And it was just like, and still is a playground and research lab now for uh-huh. me to explore different topics that I'm curious about or that I'm seeing and really diving into different signals that I'm observing in the world. And while doing that, it often leads to a conversation or something with a company that then turns into work as well. And so they really nurture each other because it's the topics that I'm writing about with out of office are just often touching on something that corporates can also resonate with. And yeah, sometimes it leads to work and sometimes it's purely for me to just explore. And that's why I also wanted to now shift it more into like a community powered research and design lab. So it's a community of people who are all sort of work-life optimists and just want to challenge the status quo of work. And so it's really nurturing my personal work, but also hopefully you're nurturing other people's work. And with that sort of really scale the change that I and all the other people that are part of this project and lab want to see in the world. Your work involves building these tools for others or for organizations. What tools do you use in your own life to help you preserve the balance and keep you from veering too much into one area? I guess my strongest tool or skill in that sense is really being very intentional about life design. And I don't think there's one tool that I could name that is really helping me to keep that balance, but it is very much about just being very intentional about the rhythms and what I need in specific moments and really trying to shape my my day around that and trying to really create pockets for myself. For me personally, I do really appreciate a morning practice. Like I do really take my time in the morning and just love to read in the morning or do some movement, do yoga, or even if I'm somewhere with beautiful nature around me, go for a hike in the morning and just take it slow and have time to put my thoughts down and together, just like breaking up the day, doing different things, having a lot of novelty in my life too, and then bringing more of that spirit into my work again as well and having some tools that I use in the work context. There's, for instance, a tool that I developed together with Dropbox, the tarot card set or something that I send to a new team that I work with every time. It's like a getting to know 
me sheet where I have a couple of questions about my personality type and what I love to do and what the latest books that I really enjoyed reading are and what my work rhythm feels like if I prefer Zoom calls or Slack or email or whatever it is. And I feel like that is a really good basis for making work itself more playful and more enjoyable as well, rather than feeling like this very serious and rigid thing. I love that you mentioned the tarot cards again, because I actually do have a set here with me. Oh, uh, yes. If you're up for it, I would <laughs> love to simulate because I got them a while ago. I've never used them before, but I would love to maybe do a, more, sure. a, a reading. All right. So there are four situation cards. The first is your current situation. The second is for challenges. The third is for chances and the fourth is team. And then I'll draw four cards. The idea is that the team member or, or person pulling them talks about how they see that in the context of their own work. All right. So I'm going to draw yes, four right. and we'll run through them. Okay. For the current situation, the card I drew is lack of communication. Are you experiencing that in your own work life at the moment or... What does that mean to you? Yeah, I feel like for me, what resonates with that is I do feel right now it's hard to have more sort of fluid conversations. I'm in Austria right now. And so sometimes I struggle with having this kind of flow in communication with some people that are on the West Coast right now because there's just like a really big time difference. Mm. And so I feel like there's always this delay. And so sometimes it's really hard to catch up with friends, for instance, on a regular basis. So that's what comes up to me. I wish there was like a little bit more of a constant flow of ideas happening. For me, I would say, so we're a remote team. I wouldn't call it a lack of communication, but recently really taking the time to do some introspection and think about how to work remotely better. Having Slack is this great, powerful tool, but like you said, if you're not intentional with it, it is easy to be reduced down into little icons of like, I'm online right now and, and this or that. So definitely an area of improvement is how I would interpret it. The second card is the challenges. How does this card reflect the challenge you're currently facing? And the card I drew was act of defense. Act of defense. Why don't you start? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you go first. Fair enough. You have to think about it. I think I tend to be an easygoing, agreeable team member. And this goes for even outside of work. I do some freelancing and I tend to be in a, a people pleasing mode. And maybe that is a lack of confidence in that area. That's something that my, my wife always reminds me of is in anything that you're doing, make sure you're not overextending yourself. You're protecting your time, your sanity. So that's mm -hmm. how I would interpret it. Mm -hmm. I need more, uh, yeah. more acts of defense. Yeah, for me, what came up now, I fully hear what you were saying. And I think for me, and by the way, these cards usually are like in a very intimate setup, so not in a public podcast. <laughs> <Fair enough>. <laughs> but <laughs> I think for me, one area where it comes up right now as well is as I'm also like defining new setups for me for work, how much time do I want to invest into specifically like out of office as its own platform and how much time do I want to invest into client work. I'm also testing my boundaries and trying to be more clear with clients as well as with myself mm -hmm. on how much time I want to commit to different things and how much I want to put into a specific project. And so trying to be more, first of all, aware of that and then also communicating that, which actually comes back to the first question and to the first cut as well, right? Mm -hmm. Like, how can I be very upfront with how I want to spend my time and be very clear to myself, but also to my collaborators? Yeah. And just for the record, I appreciate your candidness and I can cut any of this out if you would like me to. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to put that No, out. no, totally fine. <laughs> I just wanted to add the disclaimer. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, normally it's in teams and you hold this very safe space for the team. <laughs> uh -huh, uh -huh. And, I mean, even going through this right now, I can see how it can be a very powerful communicative tool for team building and just a, a useful exercise. Um, the third card is chances. How are the themes on this card appearing in the form of new opportunities? Opportunities and desires. And the card I pulled is Calmer Waters. I love that. Mm -hmm. Calmer Waters, I think for me, is an invitation. Coming back to what I mentioned before, just not taking things too seriously and just taking things slow, thinking about them long term. We're at the end of February now, starting into March. There's still a 
long year ahead of us, but also what a year is anyway. Mm -hmm. And so just taking things one step at a time, not being too obsessed with progress and making big steps and just taking things slow. I really like that. I would say similarly for me, I think it connects to some of the other cards that we talked about, evaluating any work or life situation, taking a deep breath. A lot of times things are not as do or die as they feel in the moment and getting down your communication, learning how to protect your time can calm those waters for you. So I think they're all interconnected. Um, All right. Last card, the team situation card. How do the qualities of this card play into the dynamic of you as a team? And I would be interested to hear how your take on this because you work in, in sort of a unique setting oftentimes. The card is feelings of being stuck. So yeah, so this card normally is in an invitation for the whole team to interpret. So for me, I would use it as like the teams that I'm working with right now and my community, for instance, with Out of Office. Mm -hmm. Being stuck, I'm interpreting for myself as me sometimes being too impatient, trying to move too fast and often feeling a little bit stuck. I'm also a manifesting generator in case human design, if you're familiar with that. And so I recognize that I'm often very fast and, and want to progress very fast and want to like move things. And I'm just someone who loves to experiment and prototype and just, oh yeah, let's just throw things out and test it and see what comes up and resonates. And I feel like for teammates slash people, collaborators that I work with, I think they admire that, but they're often not so fast with it as well. And so sometimes that makes me feel stuck if I feel like others are maybe not as used to this pace that I'm used to in terms of testing and prototyping. Yeah. I don't want to speak for my team, but something we do think a lot about to do is just we're a tool that has been around for 10-ish, 10 plus years. And we've been very fortunate to have users who've been with us that long. And so something we're always weighing and thinking about is how do we innovate and thoughtfully move forward and progress without alienating anyone? And what things do we hold precious? What things are we holding maybe too precious? And so that's always, that's a frequent conversation. Thank you for going through that exercise with me. That was very cool. I haven't that was fun. opportunity to use those yet. I really enjoyed <laughs> that. I guess my last question for you would be, where would you like to see out of office go in the next several years? I would love for it to become this place where people who are really interested and curious about shifting how we live and work come together. And it's becoming this co-creation platform where people can bring in ideas for how they would want to co-create things and then find collaborators around that topic. And just, yeah, having it a space where people can explore play that helps them shift their perspectives, helps them get unstuck, bring more practices into their own teams as well. So really taking things that they can learn from the community and bring them into their own organizations. And with that, hopefully be a part, a small part of making and scaling that impact in the world and actually creating a more regenerative future of work where people feel more nourished and feel more playful and feel like they can live a better life. I love that. Again, thank you so much for your time. For our listeners, where can we find you or Out of Office online? Out of Office is on getoutofoffice.network. You can sign up for the newsletter there. It's a Substack newsletter now. And so you can sign up there and you can also join occasional workshops and gatherings that are announced via the newsletter and also follow on Instagram at outofoffice.network. And if you want to reach out to me directly, I'm on LinkedIn and Instagram and all the platforms. So feel free to reach out and say hi. I'm always excited to meet new people. I will link all those in our show notes. Alice, thank you again so much. This was a really fun conversation. That will do it for this episode of Someday List. We will catch you next time. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of Someday List. We will have more interviews for you each month, so make sure to follow the show on Apple Podcasts or Spotify or follow along on social media at to do app on Instagram or TikTok and at to do on Twitter. This podcast is produced by to do. Our theme music is composed by Evan Laybourne. I want to thank our guest Alice for coming on the show again. And of course, thank you, the listener. We'll see you around. <laughs>